If you turn your Bibles, let's turn to three different portions, and then I'll, as the Lord leads, I'll open my mouth and hope that He fills it with something that will build us up and encourage us, okay? So, let's pray first. Father, we just pray for the message today, God, that your Holy Spirit would visit us. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church today. This is a new year and a new day, Lord, in all of our lives. And we want you to be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Isaiah 43, if you want to turn there first. Now, I'm going to be using the Amplified Bible. So, if, if what I read is different than what you have in your Bible, I just want you to know. I, I like to use the Amplified because to me it brings out some things that the King James or the New King James doesn't. Okay? So Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19, it says, Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now if you'll turn to Habakkuk, well Habakkuk, however you pronounce it, Habakkuk, I'm just going to read a verse. You know, but you, maybe you just want to listen. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes may be able to read it easily and quickly as he hastens by. And then one last scripture would be Proverbs 29, a verse maybe you're very familiar with. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. You know, we, we have to have a vision. We have to have some sort of spiritual goals. We, we're, we're in 2019, New Year. Friday night, I taught at our, our home group up in, in uh, Bel Air. And what I did is we just kind of like went around the room and, and allowed everyone to kind of like what is your spiritual goal for this year? Do, do you have anything? Do you have, do you have a vision? Do you, if you don't have any goals, spiritual goals, or vision, the Bible says you're going to perish. I mean, if you have nothing to shoot for in your, in your walk with God, what? What's going to happen? What are you going to get out of your Christian? How, how are we going to glorify God if we, if we don't have any vision, no, no spiritual goals for this year? You know, and, and as I taught that, then, you know, I came home after, after the Bible study, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, God, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll preach on some of what took place here at the Bible study, and then God says, no, you're not. Now, I want you to sit down there, and we're going to have a Bible study about it. I'm going to teach you, and you're going to be quiet and listen to me. So, okay, God, what, what, what am I supposed to, what do you want me to talk about today? And there's two things he wanted me to talk about, but I think I probably won't be able to get into one of them. And he said there are two things that God is very proud of. You know, he, he has in his Bible put aside two, two very important teachings for all of us. And he has devoted a whole chapter to each one of his teachings. One is his love, 1 Corinthians 13. He writes a whole chapter on his love, how we're to love. And then the other one is Hebrews 11, it's about faith. Two subjects, and I begin to think about that, and God says, you know, you talk to my church, and I'm talking to you first, Bob. You're talking to me, you're talking. And you, you tell the church, you know what they need to hear about? And we, we, we kind of take it for granted, it's all about his love. His love for us and how we're to love others. I, I begin to think, I, I wonder how many of us, because I can identify with this, sometimes people think that when you're in the pulpit, you don't go through anything. You probably go through more than most of you do. But it's like, when you go through trials and tribulations, what do we do? How do, how do we deal, I guess, the most important thing in all of our lives, in, 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 in our life, you know what it is? It's relationships. Nothing is more important than our relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationship with people. And I venture to say that probably some of you are struggling with uh, a relationship within your family. You know what? 
You can love a stranger and forgive a stranger and walk away and not feel anything. But when a family member hurts you, man, it goes in deep. You know what a wound is? A wound is something that, that, that all right, it, it penetrates, it hits, it hits the skin. But you know what a wound does? It goes down deep. It goes down to, to here where, where it really hurts. And we don't know how to, the people who are closest to us hurt us the most. And we don't know how to deal. We don't have the, we say we have love, but we don't have the love that we need to bring healing in that situation. Because we're, sometimes we're, we're a little intimidated, we're, we don't really know what to say, whatever it is, but God says, you know, you're going to love that. And I begin to look at the scriptures, and I just want to look at this, and, and, and think about your relationship in, in love with God. Turn, if you will, to uh, John chapter 21. Now, this is one of these things you're going to have to listen to because of uh, the fact that I'm going to be reading from the Amplified and not from the King James. I have one of these Bibles that 10 years ago we started our first home group. And folks were very nice because I, I used to bring my New King James and I would bring my Amplified because sometimes I would preach and open up to New, new, you know, new King James. Then I wanted to bring something out. I would, I would open up my you know, Amplified Bible. Well, they bought me as a Christmas gift one of these parallel Bibles where I have the New King James on one side and I have the Amplified on the other side so that I can, I can preach from both. And so, I, and I like the Amplified. The only thing is you don't memorize the Amplified. Let me tell you that right now. <laughs> you don't want to try, to try to memorize it. But let's just look, look at the... Jesus is speaking now to the great Apostle Peter. And he's going to be talking about love. And as I read these, remember there, there are three or four, depending on who you, who you study, Greek words for the word love. Okay? We have one word, but the Greeks have three or four different words. One means a sexual love. Another one means a brotherly love. And then there's the one that's the agape, the one that, that's divine love. It's this unconditional love that God has. And listen, listen to what our Lord says to uh, Peter. In the beginning in verse 15, says this, And when they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Others do, with reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, as one loves the Father. He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, that I have deep, instinctive, personal affection for you, for as, for as a close friend. He said, Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now Jesus is telling him and asking him, do you have my love, this, this divine love, this agape love, or do you have, what, what kind of love do you have for me? And Jesus says, you know what, I have a brotherly love for you. Again, he said to him, the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me with reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion as one who loves the Father? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, that I have a deep, instinctive, personal affection for you as for a close friend. He said to him, shepherd, tend my sheep. Peter had a brotherly love for Jesus. The great apostle called Peter. In verse 17, Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now listen to what he says. Jesus comes down a level and he begins to tell Peter, or ask Peter, do you love me this way? Do you love me with reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion as one loves the Father? Brotherly love. Now Jesus asked Peter, do you, do you love me with a brotherly love? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, that I have a deep, instinctive, personal affection for you. As for a close friend, he said to him, feed my sheep. I guess that what God 
fascinated. It, it spoke to my heart. Was what kind of love do you have for me, Bob? Is the love that I have for you is it, is it a brotherly love, or can I honestly say that the Scripture says I am to love God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and with all my strength? This is the greatest commandment. And the other is like love others as I as you love yourself. And Jesus says, as I have loved you. Can we honestly say, I mean, everyone always has to answer that. Do I really love God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and all my strength? Do I love God, this agape love, this divine love, or do I just love Him with a brotherly love? How deep is our love relationship with the Lord? Because I, I, I'm convinced that depending on how much we love God is how effective we are going to be in healing relationships. If we don't have the love of God in us, we're going to run in trouble, try, especially trying to reach family members. They are the most difficult people to reach because when they hurt us, they hurt us deep. And it takes a lot to, to bring healing in that situation. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 4. He says, well, you know, he says, the Spirit has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he says, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. We never stop and think that Jesus not only came to give us eternal life and forgive us of sin, but he said, I want you to be able to, I'm going to heal. Through me, you are going to be able to heal situations. You're going to, I'm going to heal your broken heart. And in turn, if you have my love, you can go and you can, you can heal this situation with your family. You never, ever, ever, ever give up. I remember when I first became a Christian, I used to listen to two preachers. This is going back 40 years ago. I used to listen to Jerry Falwell and I used to listen to Chuck Smith. And Jerry Falwell said this, and it's always been, it's stuck with me all this time, two words. Two words should never, ever come out of the mouth of a Christian. I quit. I quit. Should never come out of our mouth. We should never say, I quit, I can't take this anymore. I quit. Well, you know, we're, we're in the Lord's Army and we're lifers. Not in here for 20 years and then retire. I'm a lifer and you're a lifer. And God says, I quit, you never come out of my mouth. Recently, I heard somebody give a message, and he said, there are two words that should come out of my mouth. And they are these. Yes, Lord. I want you to pray for somebody, Pat. Yes, Lord. I want you to go and share the gospel with somebody. Yes, Lord. I want you to love this person. Yes, Lord. I want you to share the gospel. I want you to love them up. I want you to tell them about me. Yes, Lord. Never I quit. It's always, yes, Lord. Those are the two words that should always come out of the mouth of a Christian. When God says, I want you to do something, we don't say, well, I don't know about that. Uh, yes, Lord. Yes. But sometimes, you know what? We, we get fearful in our, in our flesh dealing sometimes with things. Some of the verses that I first uh, memorized, and I love Psalm 27 verse 1 that talks about the fact that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is, the, you know, he's my light. And he says, who, who should I be afraid of? Is there anybody that I should be fearful of or afraid of? And the answer is no, because he's my light, my salvation. Whom should I be whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? <clears throat> Nobody. Nobody. Listen to this verse. Turn to, if you got your Bible and you want to look at it, turn to uh, 1 John chapter 4 and listen to this. 1 John chapter 4 and verse Verse 18, listen to what he says. This is what, listen to what John writes here. He says, there is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full-grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors 
and expels every trace of terror, for fear brings it with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has reached the full maturity. He who is not afraid has re not reached. And so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love, is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. In verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. See, if we, if we could just get a grasp of God's love for us, it would, it would, it would, it would change us forever. I'm thinking about what, what, what goals do I have for this year? It's the goal that I always have, and that is fall in love with this one that loves me. Jesus is crazy about us. Crazy in love with us. Do you love him? Do you love him with a brotherly love? Or can you honestly say, I love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength? Do, do, can, can, you, can you honestly say that? And each one of us have to answer that. We have to look, because I mean, when I sat there and I listened to this, and God was just, Bob, where do you think you're at in your love relationship with me? Because the measure in which you love me is the measure you're going to give love to anybody else. And if you're going to give people love, you've got to give them my love, not, not what you have. Who cares about your love? I want you to give them my love. Because it's unconditional. You don't expect anything back. You just love them because that's, that's who I am. The Bible said it. God is love. That's, a, that's his very character and his very nature. And he can't help himself. That's why he loves us. Because that's who he is. And he wants us to be that. To everybody. Not only to those who are close to us. But if we're going to bring healing to people, we have to be able to forgive Jesus getting nailed to the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's love. Can, can, we, can we do that? No. Man, you nail me, I'm going to punch you right in the back. <laughs> isn't, isn't, isn't that true? I mean, we, we are, you know, we're going to be self-defensive here. And our, you know, our biggest problem is we are self-centered. And you know, God wants us to be Christ-centered. Are we really Christ-centered? I mean, it's easy to say I love God. It's, it's easy. Like a lot of people we know, say, I'm a Christian. So you move your mouth a certain way, you move your tongue, and I am a Christian. But what about what's going on inside of you? Can we say that we love God with all our heart? Man, that's a, that's a real challenge. And when that happens in us, something does happen. We change. You know, and if you really have the love of God, you know, people are going to know that. It's going to be pretty evident. Because what did Jesus say? You should know my disciples. How? Because of their love of one for another. You know, we had, we had a uh, get-together just before Christmas for all our home groups, okay? And we had it in a, in a restaurant. There was about 60 of us. And I want to tell you, we had, we had a great time. It was, it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. And you know what, I, jo Josh came up to me afterwards and said, you know, Pop, he says, I, I, I realize I, I kind of figured you'd have a good time, but I didn't think you'd have a great time. He says, I looked at this and he says, I saw the love people have for one another. I saw the joy that took place in here. You could really see the honesty of, 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 of love. I mean, it was just, after everybody left again, he comes to me and says, I can't get over this. He says, we've got to do this again in the summer. Let's just, let's, let's just plan doing these very, you know, every so often. Because it's so nice when people get together. We're not in church. We're our, we are who we are by the grace of God with each other. If you've never gone to a home group, let me challenge you right now. It will change your life. Amen. It will, it, amen. That's right. It will absolutely change your life. It's nice to know, I mean, I, I walk around the church and say hello to everybody, and I know your faces, a lot of you I don't really know personally. But there's some that I know personally, because when we go to the home group, something happens. It, it, there's, the body of Christ gets together, and you know what, there's life. We're all hurting, and if you're hurting, especially you should Because that's where you're going to get built up, that's where you're going to be loved, that's where healing takes place. Let me just see if I can find the scripture. I've been thinking about this. Ephesians chapter 3. <coughs> it 
here's a, here's a prayer that, that Paul has that we could probably pray ourselves. He says, um, let's see what I want to begin. In verse 17 of chapter 3 of Ephesians, he says, May Christ through your faith actually dwell, settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints God, who are God's devoted people the experience of that love. What is the breadth and length and height and depth of it? That you may really come to know practically through experience for yourself the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge. Get with the body of Christ and you're going you're to experience this love that goes beyond knowledge. Because we, we all love each other. We have, all have something to give each other. And that happens only if we get to know one another. Yeah, it's nice you come here on a Sunday, but then we don't see you until next Sunday. We never get to know you. And we want to know you. Not, we don't have any agenda. We just want to love you. Because that's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to love one another. And if you're not, we're not in a place where we can express that, then we'll see you next Sunday and I'll shake your hand and say hi. See you next Sunday. No, I want to love you. I want you to love me. Because when I go to these home groups, you know what? I go there because I need to be built up. I need to be loved. I need to know that I'm loved. You need to know that you're loved, especially by Christ. And that just comes through us. That's how that love comes. Through us, who are we? Nobody. But with Christ in us, we're somebody. We, we, we can change a person's life by a few words we say, by a hug, by a pat on the back. Somebody who cares and prays with you. You know, I watched people when they came for the first time to the, to the home groups. All of a sudden, you see them writing down their names and their phone numbers. Call me, I need prayer. Before that, they didn't know each other. They came to the home group, now they know each other. And, and you know, they, we cry, we pray for each other. We cry when somebody's hurt. Same with our prayer group. I go to a prayer group, you know, before we came out here, it was in the back room. Every morning, every Sunday morning, we're back there praying for this service. We pray for Pastor Rick, Pastor Josh, who's ever in the pulpit, we pray for them. We pray for every single one of you. We pray and thank God for the guys that are parking the, the cars out in the parking lot. We thank God for the worship team. We thank those guys for doing the uh, audio and visual. We thank Kathy for what she does. We thank those who greet you. We thank God for the ushers. We thank God for every single thing that takes place here today, that God will be glorified, and you know what? that you'll enjoy being in here. People serve. Man, it's nothing like serving. <clears throat> nothing like serving. You know, I, I, I went through the scriptures one time about, and began to look. I heard, I heard a preacher the other day say, uh, in the Romans, Romans chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. And I had, about a year or two ago, I, I went through every letter in there, and I began to look at that. In Timothy, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. James, half brother, half brother of Jesus, said this James, a bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude, the half brother of Jesus. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. You look through. With all these great men that we see write all these letters, and look, you know what? First thing they said about them is not that they were apostles or they wrote this book or that book. They were bond servants. They were servants. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for us to be servants. You know that word bond servant, I remember in the Greek, I learned this years ago. A bond servant is this. You know, you watch some of these movies, these pirate movies, and the guys are below deck. And the guy's beating on the drum, and they're 
boom, boom. They're doing that. That's what a bond servant is. It's somebody that's down below and at a, at a certain peak, they're, they're like this. You know what? We were unwilling servants of Satan at one time, but now we got a different drummer and his name is Jesus. You know what? We're willing servants. Before we were unwilling servants, now we are willing servants. Isn't that what we're waiting for when we get to heaven? Well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, good and faithful apostle. Not well done, good and faithful pastor. Well, not well done, good, um, whatever it is you do. Servant. He's looking for a servant. Man, we, we, we are in another kingdom. I saw this in John chapter 15, verse 9, I believe it was. I was looking at this. Jesus said this. He says, I chose you out of the world. I chose you to take you out of this world. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. You belong to me now. He paid a price. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we were bought with a price. And the price is the life and the blood of Jesus Christ. We are no longer our own. He owns us. We belong to him. We need to understand that. We realize how much... You know, I just read here that if we're going to really understand this, this love that goes beyond knowledge, you know where you see that? At the cross. You want to know about love that goes beyond human knowledge? Look at the cross. Look at the cross, and the cross will tell you how much we're loved. Greater love has no man than this, the man laid down his life for his friends. Jesus says, I call you my friends. First Corinthians 13. It's all about love. How we're to love others. And the greatest verse is, is verse 8. Love never fails. Imagine. Love never. It doesn't say once in a while or every once in a great while that you know love never. No. Love never, 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 never. Doesn't mean we win every battle, but if you're loving, you'll never, never, never fail. If you're in love. If you love people and you first love God, I'm gonna tell you right now, you'll never fail. You can't. If you because if you love like that, you're loving like God, and God never failed. He never failed. Can you imagine how many people rejected him? And you know what? He still loved. He didn't care. People mocked him, spit at him. Did all kinds of things, but you know what? He just loved. He kept on loving. That's who he is. And we call ourselves Christians. Do we love like that? You don't have to fear. Why? Because perfect love casts out fear. In 1 John 4. Perfect, true Christian love. We should not be fearful to tell anybody anything. If God says, you go confront this person and you go in love, we should not be fearful. He promised to go with us wherever we go. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And if you know in your heart that God speaks to you about going to deal with somebody in your life, especially those who are close, we just, sometimes we don't even know how to do it. We trust God. We trust God. We have a God that says, I love you more than you can ever imagine. And I want you to have that love. And we get that love, how? Through the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit sheds love abroad in our heart. And you and I, think about it. I'm looking out at all of you, and y'all got the Holy Spirit inside you. It's a good thing I don't look at your flesh. I look at the heart. I look at what's, what's going on inside. We don't, we don't, we don't measure ourselves among ourselves. We don't, we don't look at each other that way. We don't compare ourselves that way. Never. I don't think that what we do up here as a pastor or a preacher is any more important than what the ushers do or the guys parking the car or anybody else. It's, it's, it, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as more important in the body of Christ. I'm going to tell you, you get promoted in the body of Christ, you know what that means? You serve more. 
That's all it means. <laughs> you serve more, that's all. Some people want to serve more, serve more, serve more. You know, and it's fine. God gives you the grace to do that. And you deal with everything that comes down the pipe. And I tell you, John can tell you, he pastored church. I pastored the church in England, he pastored in Hama. We used to see each other in Europe. Well, but we did. We, we, he, used to, he used to have a, he used to have a, a every, every year, once a year, he had a get together for all the pastors in Europe. Because the ministry we were with had we had churches all over Europe. And we would get together at his church. But we got to know each other and we saw, man, I'll tell you, the problems, if you don't know about problems, you can ask, ask a pastor. And you go, no, I don't think I want to enter the ministry, thank you. Because <laughs> you always see what they're doing in the pulpit, it looks glamorous. But man, once you get down from the, from the pulpit, it's, it's war. It's war. It's war can be in your own family. You know, Jesus said this, I think it's in Luke, I forget which one it was now. Uh, it's Luke 9 or 26 or something. It says this, Jesus said this. He says, you are to hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children. And if you don't do that, you can't be my disciple. Wait a minute. What do you mean hate? He said, Jesus said this. Why did he say that? It's just an idiom of speech. What he's saying is, you love them less than you love me. Your love for me has to be supreme. That's what, it's almost, the way you love your family is almost hate compared to how much you love me. There's a gulf there. Colossians teaches that Jesus, uh, Jesus must have preeminence in everything in our life. Everything. All we do in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, all we do is eat, drink, whatever it is you do, you know what? We do it to the glory of God. We're His. We are His. You know what? I don't know about you, but I want that love that's in him and it's in me but it's got it's got to grow it's just it just doesn't happen because i said yes lord yes the holy spirit's in me but you know what we don't, we, we only love as much as we relinquish control of our life to god that's all being filled with the holy spirit means that god all of a sudden god i'm going to give you more control i'm going to lay off and back off and give you the control of my life I'm going to allow you to love like I've never loved. Not me. You. And so every day we have to say, Lord, fill me today. And when he fills me, I have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, tenderness. I have all of God in me. I have all of the Holy Spirit alive in me. But how much control does the Holy Spirit? Do you do your own will today, or are you doing God's will today? And this goes on all the time. It goes on in my life, it goes on in your life. And we all either surrender to that so that God can give us the love that we need to give other people. You want healings in your family? We got to love those people. <coughs> love them like they've never been loved before. You don't quit. What should I do, Lord? Should I go and talk to them? Yes, Lord. Should I love them? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Never I quit. No. We're not quitters. We're to be givers. Givers of the life of Jesus Christ. He gave his life for us, now we give our life to others so that they may know who he is. That's the only way people are going to know that. If they can't see who he is in our life, then here's some I'm going to close with this scripture. I got a few scriptures here. Now, I'm not going to even get the faith. I want to talk about faith, but I'm not. I have to do that some other time. But listen to uh, where did I want to go with this. Oh yeah, Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Like I told you, I had a Bible study with God last night. And you know what? God, God just gives you scriptures. Scriptures defend themselves. I don't have to defend the Bible. The Bible can speak very well for itself. This is God and I'm telling you is what God said. Not what I think, what I think doesn't mean anything. But what God thinks means everything. Second Corinthians chapter three. Let's see, what I got? Paul writes here in verse one, says, are we starting to commend ourselves again? 
or do we not, like some false teachers, need written credentials or letters of recommendation to you or from you, do we? Paul was going to preach and teach in Corinth and there were false teachers there and said, where's his credentials? What kind of, who does he think he is if he's marching here and teach? Then he says this, no, he says, you yourselves, this is what Pastor Rick does and Joshua is in the Pope and does, no, yourselves are our letter of recommendation, our credentials written in your hearts to be known, perceived, recognized, and read by everybody. You show and make obvious that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. Not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Earlier I read in Habakkuk about writing the vision and writing it down on tablets. We don't write our vision down on tablets. We write our vision and our revelation of God is on the tablets of our heart. We become living epistles. When people see us, they can read us. They know exactly where we come from and what it is that we believe. I said, I don't, I don't write it down on a piece of paper. So look, look at this. I want you to know who I represent. And I don't, no? You want to know what I want? Read this. Read my heart. My heart will tell you who I belong to. My heart will tell you who I represent. My heart will tell you why I love you. Because I belong to him. Well, I ain't got nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> I do, but I'm going to stop. So I just, listen, grasp this. Just think of all the, all the goals, you know, set this goal, I'm going to read the Bible, and yet they're all good things because they'll bring us to the place where we will see how much love God has for us. When you understand that, and you understand the cross and the finish, you know, all of a sudden it's like, I got to give that out. I don't, it begins to change you on the inside, and you can't, you can't hide it. It comes to the surface. It comes to the surface. So everyone can read it. And we hope that we have a nice letter. It's a letter. What is this? It's a letter of love. This is what all this is. is a letter of love from God to us. And we take it right upon our heart. And we walk out in public with that letter written in our hearts. And people know who this God is. I was going to ask you all. I did this once. I was going to ask you all to lift up your Bible so we can get Satan a heart attack. <laughs> but I'm afraid to. <laughs> I got one Bible. Do I hear two? <laughs> All right, I have some. That's not even going to give him the sniffles. Man. We, got, we, got, we want to give him a heart attack. This is a Bible believing church. And we believe the Word of God. You know, I know, I know a lot of you got on your phones and everything. But you know what? We, we need to hide this in our heart. It makes a difference. It changes. You never know, think of the power of the Word of God mixed with faith and with the Holy Spirit. We're, we're dynamite. Now, we're, 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 some, we're some of the, that will be winners. We'll be overcomers. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Father, we, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for the love that you have for us. Help us this year, Lord, to heal any relationships that are close to us. We weren't sure what would you do, but God, give us the love we need, the words we need to bring healing. We want to heal those, we want to heal those relationships, Lord. Thank you for loving us, for saving our souls. Thank you for each one that's here today. Bless them. Give them a great day. Lord, we thank you for such a great salvation. And Father, we pray to as we, we take the offering that you just bless it. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today you will make the greatest decision in your entire life. Accept Jesus, accept the one who loves you into, into your heart today.
You'll, you'll never, never regret it. It's the greatest decision any person anywhere at any time can make in this planet. It's a decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And just thank you for dying on the cross for your sins so that you might have forgiveness and eternal life. And he wants to heal you today and let you know that you're loved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.